So, well, it's over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Mike. You've obviously been doing your research on me. <laughs> I, forgot um, to record that. I forgot to record that bit, so you, <laughs> you won't get all the glow. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, yeah. What I'm going to be talking about is deserted farmsteads of Dumfries and Galloway, which is something I've been looking at on and off for about the last 10 years. Um, probably not as much as I would like over the last two years, but I haven't been doing anything as much as I would like over the last two years. I think everybody's in the same boat. Um, as Mike said, I, I'm an ecologist by profession, and it was really ecology which took me to these areas. But then I subsequently started making deliberate visits just to look at the, the history, just to look at the deserted farmsteads. Um, not an archaeologist, I'm not an architect, I'm not a social historian, I'm not a family historian, but all of those elements um, feature in tonight's talk. So um, if you are any of those specialisms, I hope you'll forgive me if uh, I'm not as uh, advanced at it as you are, but uh, hopefully covering a, a wide subject area. Once you start to decide to study something, you come up with a list of questions. And once you finish the study, you hope that you'll have a list of answers. However, anybody who knows that uh, what any study involves knows that um, you start off with a list of questions and at the end of the study you have a bigger list of questions. <laughs> um, so these are the questions I started with. I haven't managed to answer them all but hopefully this evening I will manage to give you at least some information about all of them. So what are deserted farmsteads? Where are they? What are they called? What do they consist of? When were they built? Why were they built? Who built them? Who lived in them? What lived in them? When were they deserted? Why were they deserted? And what future do they have? But the first question before any of that is, why me? I'm an ecologist. <laughs> why am I looking at deserted farmsteads? Well, I think the answer goes back right to the very beginning of my life. Uh, I was born in County Durham. This, this photograph is a picture of Teesdale. I'm actually in the valley to the north of this in Weirdale, but they're, they're quite similar. Uh, I was born into a mining family. All the mines had closed by the time I was uh, um, alive. But had I been 100, born 100 years earlier, I would certainly have been working in those mines, coal mines. Had I been born 200 years earlier, I would have been working where this photograph is. This is a, a lead mine. And the building in the center of the photograph is a, is a mine shop. That's where the miners stayed when they were uh, working at the mine. The rest of the time, when they weren't working at the mine, they were farmers. And the landscape of Teesdale and Weirdale is very much affected by both the lead mining and the farming of the community there. However, had I been born 300 years earlier in Galloway rather than in Durham, I suspect I would have been working and living in the sorts of places that I'm going to be telling you about this evening. So <laughs> I think they could well have had a personal interest for me had I, had I been around a bit earlier. What are deserted farmsteads? Well, this is a deserted farmstead. This is in the Maccas but this is not the sort of deserted farmstead I'm going to be talking about this evening. Between about 1720 and 1850, Dumfries and Galloway underwent agricultural improvements, so-called agricultural improvements, sometimes called the Agricultural Revolution. And these sort of buildings were built quite often in an L shape or a U shape or a courtyard. Um, these are improvement farms. And many of them still exist. A few of them, like this one, have become deserted, but most of them have been built over the top with modern farm buildings. So I'm not talking about those this evening. I'm talking about 
what went before those. And this is a map um, of High Tate near Loch Maven, dated 1789. And this shows you the pre-improvement farming landscape. The farmers lived in the village in High Tea here, but all of the farms, all of the farmland was divided up into strips. And each strip was owned by a certain individual. And this map's been color coded. So each color represents one individual who, who lived in High Tea somewhere. And they went out and found all this land in this mosaic of strips. And that was a typical pre-improvement farm um, from the 18th century. Uh, by the way, if you, if you want to go and see this map, <laughs> it's a fantastic map. It's in the Dumfries Archive Centre. It's about six foot long by about three foot wide. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating map. This is just a section of it. Uh, but I'd also recommend that you go and look at the National Library of Scotland website, where you can see this map online for free. Uh, but you can also compare it with the modern aerial photograph. And the modern aerial photograph is important because this is a pre-improvement pre, um, landscape, farming landscape. Um, but if you go to High Tay now, you don't see any of it. You, you see maybe traces of the, the buildings in the village, but in terms of the farmland, it's completely gone. And that is normal across um, the whole of Dumfries and Galloway. The pre-improvement landscape has been completely swept away. And this map actually shows what swept it away. These straight lines here, they were drawn up in an office by someone with a ruler um, planning a completely different landscape, an improved landscape. And if you go on the National Library of Scotland website and fade out from the map into the modern aerial photograph, you'll find this is exactly where the fields are today. So the pre-improvement landscape has been swept away and replaced with the, the improvement era fields. And that is the case over most of lowland Dumfries and Galloway. If you go into the marginal area, areas, the hills, the, the bogs, the moors, you find a different sort of pre-improvement landscape. This is the first edition Ordnance Survey map, which is the map that I've used for, for most of the visits that I've carried out. It dates from about 1850. Uh, obviously, 1850 is at the end of the improvements. And the improvements are marked on this map. These straight lines here are improvement field boundaries, field dikes. But everything else you can see here, these random irregular shaped fields and the ruins you can see marked on, um, these are all remnants of the pre-improvement landscape. And what I've been doing is finding these out places on the first edition Northern Survey map and going out and visiting them. Normally on the first edition Northern Survey map, they're ruined like this one here. But these buildings here do have roofs on. It's, it's one of the few exceptions. This is a pre-improvement, two pre-improvement buildings, but they were used in, the, used in the improvement era as well. And I will be telling you more about this particular building later on. The big difference is that in these sort of marginal areas, if you go and visit them now, it's not all swept away. If you go and visit Gargri, this particular one now, this is what you see. That's the building I was telling you about, but all of the other ruined buildings and the ruined fields are all still there. So although most of the pre-improvement farming landscape is gone, if you go to these sort of areas, you can still find it. And that's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. Not many other people have been going there, it must be said. In all of the sites I've visited, I think I've met one other person the whole time I've been there. Uh, most of them are fairly remote places, not the sort of places that lots of people go. 
And very few people have um, gone there and made a study of it. This is one of the few studies that's available. It's carried out by the Royal Commission uh, Ancient Historical Monuments and Historic Scotland. And they did the same as I did. They looked at the first edition Ormond Survey map um, and they produced a report about it. The big difference to what they did and what I did is that they didn't visit the sites. I went and visited all the sites. So my their study was completely office-based, desk-based. Mine was mostly field-based. If you want to see this report, uh, you can still download it for free off the um, Historic Scotland website. Where are Dumfries and Galloway's deserted farmsteads? Well, these are the places that I've visited. In actual fact, this map's slightly out of date. This map was prepared um, before I visited the last few. So there's about another 10 uh, that I've been to, which are not marked on this map. But this tells you where most of them are. And you can see that they're not randomly spread, they clustered. The dark, darker brown on the map is the high hills. The green is the lowland. You can see there's virtually none in the lowland. There's virtually none in the high hills either. They're all in the light brown, which is the low hills and the moors and the bogs. And they're clustered. So this is what I'm going to refer to as the New Loose cluster, centred on New Loose about here somewhere. That's the biggest cluster. Uh, the next cluster, next biggest cluster is the Mokram Moors cluster um, in the Maccas. There's another cluster in the Cree Valley. Uh, and then there's a few scattered groups up the Upper Ken Valley. Uh, in Upper Annandale and to the north of Gatehouse. And then just odd ones and twos scattered elsewhere. There's only one really that I've, I've looked at, which is close to Kikubri, which is this one here, which I will mention briefly later on. But the other one, which uh, isn't marked on this map, which I've looked at most recently, just in the last two years, is, is actually a, another one near New Abbey. So we'll say a little bit about that one at the end as well. In terms of designations, um, most of them are not designated. 26% um, of the sites are designated as scheduled monuments, but quite a few of those are designated for other reasons other than the farmstead. But there's quite a few that are designated um, for the wildlife interest. That, as I say, that was the reason that got me there in the first place. Um, sites of special scientific interest, special areas of conservation, there's only 8% of them, but actually there's another 20% which are just a few metres away from these farmsteads. It's almost as if whoever was designating the wildlife sites drew a boundary not to include the, the farmsteads. Um, so, um, quite a coincidence between ancient sites and wildlife sites in these areas. What were they called? Well, I'm not a place name specialist, far from it, uh, but Michael Ansell has, has helped me with some of the place names of, of these uh, firm tunes, which is the, the old name for um, these deserted farmsteads. He analysed 51 sites, 43 of them were, uh, the names were of Gaelic origin, six Scots, one English, and one he didn't know. Um, but it's interesting that the greatest majority of them by far are Gaelic place names. That in itself doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that they're, they're quite old um, in origin. Gaelic started being uh, spoken in Galloway about fifth or sixth century. Now, I'm not suggesting they go back as these settlements go back as far as that, um, but it continued to be spoken up until about 1600. Um, but it hung on in a few places up until about 1800. 
And these are the sort of places where Gaelic probably would have hung on the longest. So what we're looking at is uh, sites that were established with Gaelic names. And quite possibly Gaelic was the, the only language that was spoken during their entire existence. In terms of what the place names mean, um, Michael put them into uh, a number of different groups. There's 10 of them um, indicate woodland, which is interesting given that none of them are actually in woodland today. Um, Bioch meaning birch. Seven of them indicated some animals. Uh, Maddy meaning dog. 11 and related to land units. Airy is a sheiling. Uh, 12 of them were topographical names, Craig's the most obvious one, and three of them were personal names. What do they consist of? Well, the living quarters, um, the domestic sites, were buildings known as longhouses. And this one is a closs, which is in the new loose cluster. Uh, you have to remember that these buildings were, they fell down and were rebuilt many times over. So even if the site goes back to several hundred years old, the actual building itself might be much more recent. Well, probably the layout and the structure of the buildings is similar on every time they were built. And longhouses, um, you know, the, the name describes it really. They were long, low buildings, usually built of dry stone rather than mortar stone, but there could be earth or turf in between the stones. Um, two or three or four uh, compartments, and probably people lived in two of them, and animals probably lived in the other one. So the people and animals all in the same building. Uh, the roofs would have been uh, very low roofs uh, consisting of heather thatch or straw thatch or probably turfs uh, supported on wooden crook um, beams. And that is, that is fairly typical for, for most of the domestic buildings on these sites. There are a few exceptions which I will come on to later on. In terms of other buildings, usually there was a cluster of other buildings around the longhouse. This is Clockery, which is near Newton Stewart in the Cree Valley, which was excavated in 2015. There's not many of these sites have been excavated, and this is one of the few. And the fact that it's been excavated gives us a clue on, on what this particular building was used for. Um, you can see that it's got cobbled uh, floor either end, and in the middle, it's got a stone flagged floor. And it's got a doorway here and a doorway at the up on the opposite wall. And that tells us this was a threshing barn. The um, crops were stored in one end and the Threshed grain was stored in the other end, and the bit in the middle is, is where one was converted to the other using a hand flail, a fleshing flail. And this was something which would have gone on very frequently on these farmsteads. And the reason it's got a door on either end is to let the draft come through so that when the, um, the cereal crop is being threshed, um, the wind blows through and blows the chaff out, and the grain is trapped on a ledge against one of the doorways. And that ledge <laughs> has given its name to a, a word which we use quite frequently now. That is the threshold. So this is a threshing barn. And most of these sites would have had a, a threshing barn in them. We can't always manage to identify it like we have here, but most of them would have had a one. Many of them had this structure as well. This is quite often the most distinctive structure on these sites. This is a kiln. And I've given you four examples. Uh, Kloss again, New Luce. Uh, this one is another site in New Luce. 
Fall Bog is the, the one which is closest to here, which is down on the coast near Ross Bay, uh, Miko Ross. And Crawford is up near uh, Gatehouse, just to the north of Gatehouse. And quite often, as I say, these are substantial structures. The actual kiln born it, ball itself is made of stone and it tends to last quite a long time. So even when all the other buildings have gone, quite often the kiln ball survives. And at Falbug, it's only the kiln ball that survives. You may walk down there and you may have, many people do walk down there and walked along this track and not actually noticed that you're walking past an old corn kiln right beside the track there. That's four different examples. Uh, but quite often, as well as there being a kiln, there was a barn attached to it, a kiln barn. And the crop ready to be dried was stored in here and then was dried actually in the kiln itself. The fire was lit using peat as the fuel underneath there. Um, there'd be some sort of um, covering over there, probably a wattle or something like that, which the crop was laid on and the heat would rise up through it and, and dry it before it was transferred to the threshing barn. This one is at Airy Lake, which is in the Maccas, and it, it's actually one of the sites, I think it's the only site I'm talking about tonight, which I've never been to. Um, it was excavated um, quite some time ago. Um, it's a, another one of the few that has been excavated, but it's not one of the ones I've managed to get to. This is a kiln barn um, showing you its arrangement with the other buildings. This Brock Lock is one of the few Dumfrieshire sites. Um, it's up, uh, up in Nithsdale. And the kiln barn is in the foreground here. There's the kiln bowl, just there's the bowl there. And there's the barn, remains of the barn structure just behind it. And the other buildings associated with the farm are all a short distance away. And the main reason for that was because the kiln was in regular use, possibly even daily use. And obviously it had a fire in there. Um, so you didn't really want the smoke drifting too much over the, the rest of the buildings. But more importantly, this was a big fire risk. So usually the kiln was a short distance away from all the other buildings, just in case there was a a risk of setting fire to all the other buildings. Now, 68% of all the farms I visited have kilns. Uh, it's possible that some of the other ones had kilns and have been lost, but as I said, it's, it's usually the last structure to go, so that's unlikely. You'd imagine the other farms that don't have kilns must have dried the crops some other way. They probably took it to the nearest other farm town and uh, dried it in the neighbouring farm town rather than um, having their own kiln. The Ordnance Survey map actually draws a distinction between corn kilns and lime kilns. And most of them are corn kilns, but there are a few lime kilns as well. I can't actually tell the difference on the ground. Possibly with excavation you will be able to, um, but the Ordnance Surveyors in 1850 did write on corn kiln or lime kiln. Those that had lime kilns were quite often near the coast and they were burning seashells. And they were burning seashells to produce agricultural lime to spread on the land. Um, once the improvement era came along, we got the more familiar lime kiln built in an industrial process, but here it's an agricultural process. It is possible, in fact, in one of the sites I'm going to show you, it's very likely that some of the kilns also burnt lime for lime water um, to hold the, the stones together. But most of the buildings on these sites didn't have lime water. There's just one I've come across which did have a lime water and did have a lime kiln to produce it. A lot of the sites have these structures. This is a hay re. Um, hay in Scotland was traditionally dried outside. 
Um, hay barns, uh, much more of an English thing in Scotland, usually dried in stacks. Even in the improvement era, they were traditionally dried in stacks. It was only at the end of the improvement era that they started building hay barns. But the pre-improvement era, they were quite often dried in these hay rees, R-double-E. Re is a word which is almost unique to Southwest Scotland. This is an enclosure to keep livestock out rather than to let livestock in. And the hay would have been stacked inside and probably had a thatched roof to keep the, the rain off it as well. The hay was very important because that uh, was the only thing really which enabled to keep the livestock alive over the winter, because there's not much grazing over the winter. So in the days before silage, they needed some other way to keep the livestock alive. 26% of the farms that I've looked at have hay rees. This is another ree, and this is a sheep ree. Uh, this wasn't designed to keep livestock out, this was designed to let livestock in. So it's quite often got internal structures and usually has at least one, sometimes several openings in the outside wall, unlike the hay rees. Uh, we think of the sheep folds in the improvement area, era as um, structures used for shearing and dipping and things like that. Um, these might well have been used for shearing as well, but these were probably in more frequent use because the, the sheep in those days uh, were also quite often milked. So the sheep may, may have been brought into these structures for milking as well as other um, necessary things to do with the sheep. And 42% of the farms that I visited have these sheep breeds, quite often more than one. In terms of the rest of the farm structures, the dikes around the walls are very different to the improvement era dikes. Uh, first of all, they are irregular in shape. They're not straight lines. You hardly ever see a straight line. Uh, they're nearly all tumbled down now, but you can still usually detect some earth or turf mixed in the wall. It almost as looks like whoever was building them just put the head down and put one stone in front of the other without any planning at all. The map I showed you earlier of straight lines certainly didn't exist in pre-improvement farmsteads. And this is Calgary again in the Maccas. And this just shows you what I was telling you about there. The farms, the, the fields are almost completely random shape. Um, all sorts of higgledy piggledy patterns. Uh, the, re the rest of the buildings and the structures on these firm tunes, um, the buildings are here. Um, there's only one domestic building in this particular site, but where there's more than one, and quite often there war was more than one, because quite often there was multiple tenants um, farming each firm too. So if there's more than one long house, quite often the two or three are close, very close together, just with a very na narrow passageway between them. And then they quite often have a kale yard around, which is effectively the garden where they grew kale and other beans and other vegetables um, for the people to eat. And a few other structures gathered around the outside of the kale yards. Here again, the kiln, this is the kiln here, is slightly separate from the main groups of buildings. And then you've got all the fields here, which is known as the in-by or the infield. That is the hay re there. This one does have some sheep pens, but these are improvement era sheep pens. And this is the improvement era dike, straight line, very different to the pre-improvement ones. So the in-by um, was where they grew the crops. This, that wasn't for the animals, that was where they grew the crops. The out by the 
the rough common pasture, moorland is where they where the animals grazed and where the hay was cut quite often. So these fields were actually, they were growing cereals in these fields. 82% of the farms that I've looked at have these field systems. It's likely that all of them would have had these field systems at one time. This is a site which is just to the north of Gatehouse, uh, a bit of snow lying on the ground, which helps to um, highlight some of the features. You can see again, the random shape of the fields. Uh, the buildings would have been in here somewhere. But because the snow lying on the ground, you can also see these lines in the fields. And that shows you that the fields were ploughed for growing crops. And if you manage to get a closer look at some of these fields, you can still see the rig and furrow lines today. Um, they would have been ploughed probably by teams of oxen. Um, oxen didn't necessarily get replaced by horses. Quite often oxen continued for a long time, but there was farms in other areas where they never had oxen. They had horses from the beginning. It wasn't necessarily that one automatically changed to the other. But, and the sort of farms I've been looking at, it was likely it was teams of oxen that were doing the ploughing. And they have these very distinctive curved shapes simply because when small fields and when they got to the end uh, they needed to start turning the, the plow team quite early so you get the uh, distinctive um, it's a reversed s shape quite often and a bit of snow helps show that up 56 percent of the farms that i've looked at have these cultivation rem remains it's likely again that all of the farms at one time would have had them this is a site near Ken Ryan, and there's no snow on the ground here, but you can still see the cultivation remains coming up and down the slope. They always went up and down the slope rather than across the contours. And the reason for that is because this is in the days before underground drainage. So the rig and furrow um, not only enabled them to plant the crops, um, both on the ridges and in the furrows, um, but the furrows were used as the only form of drainage. So the, the, the water ran off down the furrows. And here, where bracken has taken over, the bracken is now growing on the, um, on the ridges where the deep soil is, and the furrows where the shallow soil is um, don't have bracken. So you can still see the, the ridge and furrow um, on this site. But some of the fields were so small that they couldn't actually plough them at all. And this is another site in the Mokram Moors cluster. And um, here you can see in the centre, this small field here has ridge and furrow, but it's much narrower and it's much straighter than the ones created by ploughing. And these are lazy beds, these are dug by hand um, to, to grow crops in. Lots of these sites, um, although they're not in woodland anymore, they do have trees on them. And they have what is termed ecologically as veteran trees on them, trees that are quite old, but have quite often been managed as well. They've been uh, pollarded or even coppiced sometimes. Um, this is Crawford, which is a site to the north of Gatehouse. Um, it's the main tree here you can see is an ash tree, but it's got a couple of second walls in the background as well. All three of those trees are growing on the field boundaries, or in the case of the second walls, they're actually growing on the boundaries, on the walls of the buildings. So that suggests that these are trees which have come in after the site has been abandoned. The site has been abandoned, the seeds have managed to take root in amongst the, the stone rubble. 28% of the farms I've looked at have these veteran trees. But there are some, like this one here near Kakawan, um, where the indication is that 
the trees were there at the same time as the farm was occupied. These trees are not on the field boundaries, they're actually in the middle of the field. This is an ash tree again, and behind it is a crab apple. Ash is the most common tree on those sites. Crab apple is actually the second most common tree on the sites that I've looked at. Um, oak is one of the rarest. Um, if you look on the 1850 map, both of these two trees are marked on as mature trees in 1850. I don't know how old they are. It'll be interesting to get some tree ring analysis done, but my suspicion is that both of these trees were present when the site was occupied and possibly the crab apple was performing, you know, some sort of useful purpose in crab apples are not that nice for humans to eat, but possibly for, for animals were, were feeding on the, the crabs. Um, there is someone who's doing some DNA analysis of crab apple trees to find out whether there's any domestic apple in. So I'm going to get some leaves from this tree and give them to him and he can work out whether there's whether this is a truly wild crab apple or whether there's some domestic apple mixed in with it. When were they built? Why were they built? Who built them? Who lived in them? Well, many sites, 68% um, of the sites are associated with prehistoric features. Uh, this is a one near New Luce, which, well, this is a Bronze Age burial cane near New Luce, but it's got a farmstead very close to it. It's got, in fact, it's got several farmsteads very close to it. Other farms are associated with burnt mounds, hot circles, standing stones, cup and ring mark stones. Is it possible that prehistoric people started farming in these areas and they've been farmed ever since? Well, I can't rule it out, um, but I haven't found any direct evidence that the um, 18th century, 17th, 18th century sites um, have a direct link to the prehistoric sites. It's much more likely that the sort of areas that the um, prehistoric sites remain, um, the prehistoric sites have managed to survive there for exactly the same reason that the farmsteads have managed to survive there. The marginal areas, they haven't been subjected to modern agriculture or modern forestry. So it could be, it's just a coincidence that the two of them have managed to survive in the same areas. This is another prehistoric site, um, Lagangarn stones. It's prehistoric, the stones are prehistoric, but they've got medieval crosses marked on them. A couple of small crosses there and a much bigger one there. Uh, the link between prehistory and firm tune here is <laughs> a very different sort of link. Uh, Lag and Garn standing stones is believed to have once been a stone circle. Um, but now there's only two stones left. And if you read some of the reports, um, some of the stones which are no longer present were taken and built into the, uh, the farm buildings, used as lentils in the farm buildings. And it's, it's quite likely that as a coincidence, a prehistoric and uh, pre-improvement farming, but it's quite likely that the pre-improvement farms stole the stones from the prehistoric monuments. So it's, it's not a case of agriculture continuing, but it's a case of the stones continuing on the same site. It's quite possible these two stones survived. They weren't robbed because they've got the, the crosses marked on them. It's quite possible that the crosses prevented the um, the farmers from stealing them and building them into the farmsteads. There's much stronger links between um, the medieval period and the um, 17th, 18th century farmsteads. This is Gutsch's Isle, which is on the Colvin coast. 
and this is one of the few sites which does have a little bit of um, historical research attached to it. They, some of the names of the people who lived here have been traced and they do go back to late medieval times. And the building is believed to be um, what has loosely been termed uh, a basil, which is a defensive building, which had livestock on the ground floor and the upper floor, and there is a fireplace in this um, gable here, so it did have an upper floor. The upper floor is where the, the people lived. So rather than having people and animals at different ends of the buildings, they had people and animals above and below each other. So this dates back to medieval times and um, you know, has, has a link um, to late medieval times. And 28% of the farmsteads that I've looked at um, do have a link back to medieval features. In fact, all of the farmsteads in Dumfries do have a link with medieval features. So they probably go back to maybe 15th, but certainly 16th century. This is another example, uh, Rocklock again in Dumfriesia. And the, the building here is some sort of um, lesser tower house. Um, so again, it's likely to have had more than one floor and possibly livestock on the ground floor and people above. But this one's a much more obvious link. Blacklaw Tower, which is in a forest clearing by the side of the motorway to the north of Moffat. Uh, this is the site which has two kilns, has a lime kiln, which is probably used to supply the material, or some of the material, which went into building Blacklaw Tower. And Blacklaw is a definite tower house. It still has uh, a vaulted ground floor. Um, the vaulted ground floor was probably used for storage most of the time, but was there in case it was attacked and they could drive the, the livestock into their vaulted ground floor for protection and the people on the upper floors. Now, we, we tend to think of um, lots of these farmsteads as being occupied by, shall we say, the, the, the lower um, end of the social class. Uh, but black law um, demonstrates that that wasn't always the case, because black law was a, a Johnson tower, Johnson being one of the, the main families in Annandale. Um, so the, the opposite end of the, the social class scale. Um, but the buildings around it are very similar to, to all the buildings found elsewhere. This is a, an area you might recognise, a little Cullen Dock, big water of Fleet Viaduct in the background, um, near Gatehouse. Um, this site, as far as I know, hasn't had any detailed research on it, but the building the domestic building which survives again gives the impression that it's some sort of um, defensive structure, possibly a small tower house. The walls are about a meter thick, which is much thicker than most of the other buildings on most of the other sites. Um, again, it's possible this was uh, some sort of uh, simple tower house. But if you think about it, a tower house is just like a long house tipped on its end. It's just if you had the, the money and the resources and the ability to, to build um, a more defensive structure, uh, you could go ahead and do that. There's, there's one of the sites which, um, <laughs> one of the sites which I looked at quite recently has, it's a bit of a strange site, it seems to have an alternative use as well as farming. The structures themselves look like buildings on lots of the other sites, except for this one, which has an arch. It's the only one that I found that has an arch. But the arch looks like it's a later addition. It looks like it's being added into an old building. None of these buildings are dated. Um, they're such simple buildings that they didn't bother putting dates on them, except this one. This is the only one which is dated. And it's dated here with a date stone that says 1734. But again, it looks like the date stone 
as a later edition. And it's got some initials on there. I managed to trace quite a lot of the people who lived here, but the initials don't match any of the people who lived there. It's got another structure, uh, another inscription, which looks like a wine glass. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I've had a guess um, that this structure, as well as being a farm, we know it was a farm, um, my guess is that it was also an inn. And um, there is a well there, and there is another structure which I haven't managed to confirm yet, but possibly might have been used for brewing beer. The main giveaway is it's right next to the old military road um, near Kakawan. So they had a ready market of customers coming past on the old military road. I suspect it's used as an inn, if it was used as an inn, it's much later than its use as a farm. Um, it does actually have another dated stone, which is dated 17th of May, 1889. And it's also, it's not initial, it's got the person's name on, John Law or John Laws, who's a name that doesn't match any of the names I've, I've come across. We know that Drumbuie was completely um, abandoned and deserted by 1889. So why John Laws was carving his name there, I don't know. But he obviously had something to do with the site, because as well as his name, he carved the words Drumbuie. So this is a bit of a, a puzzling site and a bit of a one-off compared to all the other ones. Uh, this is the ecologist in me coming out. Um, as well as who lived in them, what lived in them. This is little Colin Dock again, the gatehouse uh, by the big water of fleet. Uh, when I was looking at the site, which was about this time of year, or slightly later, about March time of year, um, the tower house structure is, is about there. But if you look in the foreground here, you see the current occupants of little Colin Dock. There's an adder. And whilst I was there, um, I found seven of them. <laughs> so the site is currently obviously used as a hibernacular for adders, which got me thinking, um, did adders live there at the same time as people lived there? Chances are they did. Um, in which case, what was the relationship between the people and the adders? Uh, when I gave this talk elsewhere, somebody suggested an answer, which is quite likely that the people probably ate the adders. <laughs> adders were used as food. Um, that hasn't been documented as far as I know, but it, it does sound as if it's a, a strong possibility. In terms of other wildlife, this is a site which I visited just about a year, year and a half ago, uh, Kakenen, which is just on the far side of the Murrick. It's a site which was a pre-improvement farm, but then was um, built over it as an improvement farm. The original buildings would have been turf roofed or thatched roofed. And subsequent buildings, you can just see in the background, there's still one there, were slate roofed. But the original turf roof building there's a tradition which extends all over Britain. It's more common in England, but it does, does occur in Scotland as well, of planting this plant on it. This is called house leek. It's not a native plant to Britain, um, but it's been known in Britain since about the 13th or 14th century. And people planted it on roofs because they thought it brought good luck, good luck and stopped the thatched roof from going on fire. There's no evidence that it did, but that's what they thought. It's a rare plant in Dumfries and Galloway now. Speaking to the botanical recorder for Kukubushire, he only knows two or three sites for it in Kukubushire. But it's interesting that here it survives on the wall head. The roof isn't there anymore. There isn't, a, isn't any sort of roof, a turf roof, a thatched roof or, or a slate roof. The roof is gone. But the house leak, still survives. It is a plant which is planted in gardens quite a lot, 
that this site is so remote, I can't believe that people would have planted it in the garden here. So the only thing I can think of is that it was brought to be planted on the roof for good luck 150, 250 years ago and still survives to this day. Even though the roof doesn't survive, obviously didn't bring that much luck. The surrounding fields, as well as the buildings, um, had their own wildlife. The, the fields immediately surrounding the buildings, as I said, they were planted with cereal crops. Um, and it's interesting that there's not much in the term way of wildlife survives in those fields anymore. It's just decades or centuries of continual plowing and growing crops has removed most of the wildlife interest. But the, the outby, the common grazing, which was cut for hay, um, generally still has quite a lot of wildlife interest. Although maybe not quite as much as it once did have. On the sites that I visited, I've obviously taken note of the wildlife. Wheat ears, typical bird that nests in dry stone dikes and dry stone buildings. And quite often you'll see them on these sites today. I would imagine they would have been present on those sites right throughout the entire history. They'd have been nesting in the dikes, even when people were, were still farming the land. Stone trad. See quite often on these farms now. It's a typical bird that you see around the farm buildings. But it's a bird which is affected badly by um, cold winters. Obviously, we don't get that many cold winters now, so we do see stone chats quite a lot. Probably when the people were farming there, they probably didn't get that much in the way of cold winters. So they probably had stone chats. But in between, when we had cold winters, probably the stone shads disappeared from these sites. So these are birds that are probably come and gone according to the climate. Uh, curlew is a fast declining bird in Scotland and in Britain. And it's a bird which you hardly see on these sites. I think I've seen one pair of curlew. I haven't always been at the right time of year, but uh, when I have gone at the right time of year, I've only seen one pair of curlew associated with the fields around these farmsteads. Um, my theory is that um, that wouldn't have been the case in the past. The cutting of hay and the grazing of livestock in these uh, wet areas, these um, fields, these commons, would have provided an ideal sort of habitat for curlew to nest in. Now I'm sure the residents of these farmsteads would have eaten curlews had they got the chance and they definitely would have eaten curlew eggs and they would have got the chance to do that. But probably the management of the habitat was good enough to enable the curlews to withstand the predation. Whereas now when they've been abandoned and there's no farming at all on a lot of these sites taking place, it's not good for curlews. There's hardly any curlews there at all these days. Birds of prey, this is a merlin. I have seen merlin on a couple of these sites. Um, and I have seen other birds of prey as well. So that's a, a group of species which you will see there today. Um, I like to think that you'd have also seen them when they were occupied and used. Um, because birds of prey were much more widespread in the pre-improvement era. The improvement era was not an improvement era for birds of prey, because as well as um, intensification of farming, it was the time of game shooting, and birds of prey were not welcome on improvement era farms. And shooting areas. They were heavily persecuted and shot in large numbers. So maybe merlins and other birds of prey you see there today, and you would have seen in the past, but you definitely wouldn't have seen them in between times. <clears throat>
This is a bird I would like to see there today, but it's very rare in Dumfries and Galloway now, black grouse. Again, it's very rare in Dumfries and Galloway because the habitat has changed so drastically. A um, lot of dense forestry, which is not good for it. A lot of um, improved agricultural fields, which is not good for it. However, if you look at the um, pre-improvement farming that I've described, which consists of um, cereal crops, probably fairly weedy cereal crops, wet meadows cut for hay and grazed, scattered trees, that sort of habitat, that description of the landscape is perfect for black grouse. If you were designing a habitat for black grouse today, that is exactly what you would have. So my belief, which is backed up from some of the evidence, some of the figures, that, a few figures that we do have, as the black grouse would have been quite a common bird in those times. Um, again, they would have been eaten, but probably the habitat management was such that the, the numbers eaten could be sustained by the quality of the habitat. Another wildlife feature which you come across very frequently on the farms, I didn't start counting them until I was halfway through and I wish I had counted them, is anthills created by yellow meadow ants. And to get an anthill this high takes probably over a hundred years of the ground not being disturbed. So these suggest that because you get them on the in-by, these suggest that the in-by hasn't been disturbed, hasn't been ploughed for at least a hundred years. So these anthills have probably colonized the site after the site has been abandoned by people. And in some of them, like um, the, the ones to the north of Gatehouse, there's absolutely thousands of the anthills on the site. And this is one of the sites near Newton Stewart. There's thousands of them on this site as well. As I say, I didn't start counting them, but I would guess 75% of the sites have anthills on them. However, as I said earlier, the improved fields, the, the ploughed fields on the end by um, generally a species poor. There's, there's not a lot of botanical interest in them, but there are exceptions to that. And this is Paul Maddy um, in the Ken Valley. And this has this plant here, which is called Spignal. And it's a very rare plant in Britain but it's not a rare plant in Galloway. It's, it's quite widespread in Galloway. It's interesting that it's on the, the in-by because um, cattle and sheep won't eat it. Um, it smells of aniseed. I don't know if that's what puts the cattle off, um, but they won't touch it. Um, but it has managed to survive the areas uh, on the in-by of Paul Maddy. And it's, it's actually one of the best um, areas for this plant in the whole of Britain, um, up, at, up at Paul Maddy. The trees have their own particular wildlife, which again uh, demonstrates some historical links. This is a photograph I took this year, 2022, of a lichen, um, which doesn't have an English name, it only has a scientific name, Sticta limbata which occurs at Crawford, which is near Gatehouse. It occurs on that ash tree I showed you earlier. But this tree, this, this uh, lichen, is an indicator of ancient woodland. You don't find it in modern woodland. So like the place names I showed you earlier, it's an indicator that trees or woodland have been present on this site for probably two or 300 years at least. So the wildlife tells you a little bit about the history as well as the archaeological remains. When were these sites deserted and why were they deserted? Well, these are two of the questions that I don't have precise answers to yet. 
were they abandoned when the improvement farming came along? It is possible because you, you find improvement features on 82% of the sites that I've looked at. But usually it's not the improvement features wiping out the features beforehand. It's usually the features from the two different eras sitting side by side. So here you've got an improvement era, era sheep fold, and in front of it, you've got a corn kiln. This is a site near Newton Stewart. And very often you will find pre-improvement era and improvement era farmsteads sitting right next to each other. It wasn't that one wiped out the other. But maybe on some other sites where the pre-improvement features have gone, maybe that did happen. This is Gargri, which I've shown you a couple of times already. This is the, uh, the old farm house, long house, but it was rebuilt during the improvement era for the, um, the shepherd to live in here. And it's got mortared walls. Um, but that's one of the few examples that I've come across where the, the modern farming has replaced the old farming directly one on top of the other. Most of the other sites, as I said, they sit quite happily next to each other. This is Clockery again, near Newton Stewart. This suggests another possible reason why this particular site may have been abandoned. This is the long house here. The corn kill is somewhere there on the horizon and between it there's a dike and this is not an ordinary dike this is a dike around um, a sheep uh, a deer park um, this is um, Comloden deer parks and we know when it was built it was built in 1824 um, but the farm couldn't have continued it's possible that the house was continued in existence, lived in, but the firm tune couldn't have continued to operate because the dike was built in between the two of them, split right across the middle. So was the firm tune abandoned in order to build the deer park? Or had it already been abandoned and then the deer park was built in 1824? Again, I don't have the answer to that. What future do they have? Well, most of them now are, are in areas of modern farming, but they're not high intensity modern farming, a very low intensity modern farming. So this is a one near New Luce. You can see the sheep grazing around and there's improved grassland around there. Modern farming of this type isn't a threat to them at all. The two of them sit quite happily together. Um, and there's no evidence I've come across of modern farmers intentionally trying to destroy these, these old structures. Much more of a threat is modern uh, forestry. This is the site I mentioned at the beginning near New Luce. Uh, no, not near New Luce, near New Abbey. Um, and believe it or not, there's a farm, an old farm building buried under the heather and under the bracken and under the Sitka spruce. It's got the, the old ash tree, which is a good indicator that it's there. And you, you go and dig around and you actually find the remains of it. But modern forestry has been planted directly on top of it. And this is actually the second generation of this forestry. Um, there's been two crops that have gone right on top of this, these farm buildings. This is Lag and Garn, this is near New, New, New Luce. Um, here the forestry has avoided the farm buildings. They haven't been planted directly on top. The Southern Upland Way actually goes right through the middle here. But all of the fields have been planted. So the field system has been lost. The buildings have survived, but the field system has gone. But there is some more positive stories. This is Paul Maddy again. 
Um, this was planned to be planted with forestry, um, but a forester actually saved it. Michael Ansel, who I mentioned, helping me with the place names. His father, also Michael Ansel, worked for the Forestry Commission at the time. And when he saw that this was due to be planted with forestry, he um, intervened and managed to get the forestry pushed back to the edges. So Paul Maddy has not only survived, but is one of the few sites which is actually promoted and advertised and you can go and visit it and look around it. And there's interpretation, which tells you something about it. I think the interpretation has actually been renewed since I took this photograph. So it's one of the few firm tunes which you can go and look at and find something out about it without having to dig around amongst the ruins and um, through the, the archives and search around. It's, it's got interpretation which tells you about it. And I'm going to finish off just with the, um, the last of these sites which I've visited just in the last year or so. Um, and I, I really visited it as a result of doing one of these talks. I did one of these talks just before the last lockdown and um, somebody afterwards suggested that I go and visit this site near New Abbey. Uh, it's a site that ordinarily I wouldn't have visited because it's under forestry but I'm pleased that I did go and have a look around. This is a map from 1759, an estate map. It's called Clackrum Heads. Um, and you can see how it's got the infield and outfield. It actually says outfield arable and outfield, outfield muir pasture, muir pasture. Um, and then the clusters of buildings three clusters of buildings here and a few scattered other buildings around the site. This is the first edition Ordnance Survey map of the area. So this is eight, about 1850. And this gives you a better impression of, of what's there. You've got the improvement era fields, the very straight, regular shaped fields. But then you've got the old, irregular, random shaped fields, say it's old fences. The old map often called it old fences when they're actually dikes. Um, that sort of random pattern of fences of dikes around there. Buildings, once we started looking, we found 17 different buildings. We've actually found another one since then. There's 18 different buildings around this site. But because it was under forestry, some of the buildings, like this one, actually had trees planted in the middle of the buildings. And it was some local people who told me about this site. And um, as I say, once we started looking at it, it turned out to be very interesting. But then we discovered that the trees were due to be felled um, a few weeks afterwards. Uh, they have now been felled, they were felled just this winter, still in the process of being felled right now. So we're quite concerned on how these trees could be felled without damaging the buildings. So we spoke to Andrew Nicholson, the county archaeologist. He spoke to the forestry company and they managed to come up, or between them, they managed to come up with a plan to remove the trees but preserve the farmstead which is good because not only is there a farmstead there, but there's the traces of the, the fields. And there's this structure, <laughs> which is a main road. This is the old main road between Dumfries and New Abbey. Uh, I believe the bridge in New Abbey has a date on it, which I think is about 1715 or something like that. So, from 1715, they used the new road, but up until that time, this was the main road. That wasn't marked on the old maps. It was only when we come to look at the site that we discovered the road. Now the trees have been taken off, but because the trees have been taken off carefully, you can see there was tape marked around the trees here, 
They were cut and removed using machinery without damaging the walls. The buildings have been exposed again. They're all covered in moss because they've been under trees for the last 50 years or so. Um, but we're now in conjunction with some local people uh, and maybe with some help from David Devereaux, um, wondering whether we can take some of this moss off just to get a better view of the, the trees, of the buildings which um, were once there. So Cluckrum Heads um, is an interesting site from, from lots of different points of view. Um, but in terms of its survival, um, it wasn't mapped in 1850, but if you go to the Ordnance Surveyor who uh, asked the local people in preparation of the map, um, he knew what was there and he described what was there. A number of old houses in ruins on Barley Hill. They are said to have constituted a village at some remote period. The remains of an old road is still visible, which led through it from New Abbey to Dumfries. He didn't mark the road on his map, but he knew it was there. Um, that was how he described it in 1850. If I was to describe that in 2022, I could use exactly the same words. So the site, um, although it hasn't been used, it's been deserted and abandoned for the last 170 years, could still be described in exactly the same words as it was described 170 years ago. And who knows, because it's escaped being damaged by forestry this time, in 170 years time, somebody might still be able to use that exact phrase again for this site and the future. And there my talk ends. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. You just uh, that's a clear uh, stop share. There we go. Um, right. Um, uh, yep. Um, you probably didn't see it, but one on chat we had a couple of comments. One was Maggie Mac Mackay, Mackey. He said that her great grandfather lived at Brochloch. Oh, right, right. Yep. And then Robert Colvin said that his father lived in a, on a farm uh, in Weardale, I think it was, and they had house leak, and they apparently used to use the liquid from the plants for curing ailments of the eyes to do with the right. eyes. Right. Um, Interestingly, in those places in England where they still have thatched roofs, they still grow house leaks on it. Hmm. I don't think there's any uh, sort of folklore associated. I think it's just because of tradition, but they still grow house leeks on those roofs. Right. So if anybody has any questions, just unmute yourself and uh, ask away, and I'm sure Peter will be happy to answer them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if there might be a reason why there seem to be more deserted farmsteads in Wigtonshire than the rest of uh, increase in Galloway. Yes, uh, it's probably because the, the rest of Dumfries and Galloway has been subject to a lot more um, modern farming and modern forestry. Uh. Uh, I mean, Wigtonshire probably had a lot more of 